evening, everybody. How you doing? My name is Miguel Narvaez, Jr. Um, I'm a student here at Western New Mexico. It was a um, graduate. This is what he got me know this. He's a local activist, interpret and <laughs> local activist, cultural preservationist, and social justice educator. Um, we've been trying to get some events going on um, to get our, our club going. It's, we think it's something that's really important. We have a bunch of students here who um, I've been happy to work with, and we finally got something going with somebody that we are happy to bring up to you guys. So it's it's really just a just a, a great starting point, at least for our club here at Western New Mexico University. And we're happy to have somebody who is going to teach us on you know the function of the asset calendar today. Um, he's plenty educated in, in in these type of things, and um, I'll leave the floor to him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a little house stuff. Um, welcome. Also, want to thank you for showing up uh, this evening for this presentation. Uh, in the back, my sons are sitting at a table with uh, books from our personal library at home. And uh, feel free to, to browse through any of those books. If you can, sign the sign in sheet, get your name and email, and I'll let you know about future events. This is a one part in a series of teachings that I'm hoping to, to uh, do in the community and more geared towards children, high school, junior high and high school age. So I figured if I start by bringing it to Bayard, which we did a couple months ago, and uh, we have a few people that were at Bayard at that time here. And uh, come on in guys, come in and sit down. So uh, we're just getting started. And uh, so yeah, sign in the signing sheet when you get a chance to look at some of the books. I also have a reading list here of 13 of the top books that I recommend from introductory, Mexican history, to all the way to advanced. And there's so much literature now uh, that has been written over the years, in, in, you know, the last 20, 30 years by scholars on Indian, what's called Indian or indigenous history, and specifically with regard to Mexican and Mayan history. That uh, if you take that list home with you and you just look those books up, you can find them online. And I just suggest that you, if, you're, if you like this presentation and you want to expound on that for yourself, just go ahead and read those books and then provide them for your children also. Um, it's a good list of the top 13 that I recommend that uh, you, you start with. Um, and then, and like again, I say that the two most easiest that a junior high kid can read and then you go, you go all the way into advanced where we start getting into the deeper layers of indigenous history and uh, the native mind and the genius of our mind and what we brought to this world um, on this side of the globe, on this continent, from the top of Canada all the way down to the bottom of South America. And uh, you'll be hearing that along as well in this presentation. This isn't just a specific uh, presentation on only Mexican history. This is a reflection of indigenous knowledge over the last, uh, I'd say, you know, we go back 20, 30,000 years. And then what we see is a culmination here of the indigenous mind in this one symbol. So it's layered. However, this will be an introductory presentation. It will be very, very intense. And for an hour, 45 minutes, I'd like to go and then leave 15 minutes of questions and answers at the end. So that way uh, we can agree to meet at another date and get deeper into the layers. So I, in May, we're supposed to be going back to Bayer at the library where we presented a couple months ago. And then it'll be part two of this presentation. I'm doing it on this side of town today. So this will be the introduction with a little bit more. So for those who read that other presentation, there'll be a little bit more here. And then uh, we'll get deeper into the layers as time goes on. And hopefully, we'll have some educators from the community, teachers, invite me to their schools to do this presentation for kids. Reason being, this has to do with identity. So as we get into this, we understand that this is an identity that is is so beautiful and so powerful that if young children learn this from a small age, they will know who they are as they go further into life without questioning where they come from, who they are, uh, what language we speak, uh, our, our very unique identity um, that's different from an American identity or a European identity. This is a purely indigenous identity that we are deeply connected to from birth, even going all the way back to our ancestors who, were, who left this here for us, who built this for us. And uh, so with that, uh, we can begin. 
Um, I'd like to, to also uh, say thank you to Meta for inviting me. Um, when I came to them, it was yes, immediately, and, and they set everything up. Um, if you're not in, 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 in informed or if you, you're, you're not aware of what Meta means, Meta, the, the letters M-E-C-H-A stand for Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Aslan, which means the, the movement of a Chicanos, a student Chicanos from Aslan. And we'll learn about what Aslan means in this presentation. But this is an organization that started as a result of uh, fighting and the social justice movement. There's a carryover from many other expressions of organization of students fighting primarily students fighting to have a right to study our history in the classroom, um, to, be, to be able to have access to our books and knowledge, our ancient history and ancient knowledge in the classroom setting. One of the reasons why I'm here today and I'm doing this and the impetus for me wanting to bring this to people for free is because at different times in history, they didn't let us study our history. Then when we, were, we fought through this organization, many other civil rights organizations to get that right in, in the schools, it was constantly under attack. Just recently, in the last you know, few years, they banned Mexican-American studies in the Tucson Unified School District. In Texas, they banned certain uh, aspects of our history and rewrote books or banned certain books by certain authors that presented a a, a true form of our history and then had other writers work a history book into into the classrooms that was watered down now why is it under attack why is it that we're not allowed to study our history why is it that we're not allowed to identify with this history because this presents a threat to the established order the established consciousness or mindset of a culture that values um, Profit, exploitation, war, uh, you know, the commodification of, of things. It, it values watering things down to get to be able to continue to make that profit at the expense of making everything the same. So this is different. So should we value diversity? Of course. This teaches diversity. This teaches and <coughs> shapes and molds people's minds to be uh, more empathetic and more understanding of people, different cultures, different language, different color, different backgrounds. So, um, so that's just, I just wanted to say that. So what, what I'm teaching here has been banned in our country. Um, we see this symbol everywhere. However, it's not taught in the schools. It's, it's not taught as a system of knowledge that can lead a child to an, an identity that is positive, healthy, and productive. So this is something that we're going to learn today that is going to, you're going to go home with and be like, wow, I want more of that and I want the kids to learn this. So everything, I'm sure you read this already, everything in this one symbol, all of this is contained in this symbol. As we move along, I'm going to do an introductory on the people that this came out of. How, how did this come about? Who brought this about? Where did it come from? What minds brought this about? Coming from an indigenous perspective, but with Mexican being focused uh, on the Mexican culture, we'll begin to understand how this came about, how this symbol was developed and came out of the human consciousness. Let's see if I can if I can get this to start up here. I just have to put this put this back in, I think. Bear with me for a second. <clears throat> okay, that's working. Let's see. Okay, my technologist, maybe you can help me. I'm just trying to get it, it's on and everything. I'm just trying to get it to switch over. Okay, thank you. Okay, so as we, just to let you know, these two, I want to give credit to one of our greatest teachers that produced these feminist family. His name is Masatsi. He lives in California, he travels all over the world and teaches about this mechanism of the universe of cosmos. It's called the Tona Lama, the passing of the days of the sun. And it's a whole system of keeping time 
that is in balance and harmony with the universe, with the world and planets and the universe. And I, at the end, I'll pick somebody's birthday and we'll find their birthday on here and then I'll tell you what days are associated, what you were born, what's associated with that day. Kind of like astrology, but it's Mexican astrology. And we can, you can find out, you know, who, you, what your cosmic companions are, all those little symbols there will show you when, when you came into this earth, you took your first breath, the energy of the universe put a stamp on you, and then your destiny has been guided by this. All right? And you don't have to be just be Mexican. You can be anybody on earth. That's what this, this means. It represents that. The language that Mexicans speak before the Spaniards arrived is called Nahuatl. It comes from the word Nahuatl for in up water. I'll use my, my, my pointer here. So now we in Nahuatl is four, at is water. So four waters, literally translated four water. Or that which flows like water, or that which is beautiful and, and flows or sounds like water. This language is like English today. Back then, before the European arrival in the 1400s, you guys know Columbus in the 1400s, and then Hernan Cortes showed up in 1519. So for a hundred years, you know, we had the Spanish coming. And when they arrived, there were massive groups of people that spoke this language. To this day, up to a million people still speak this language in Mexico. Different tribes, different dialects. Not just in Mexico, also in southern United States. This is the native languages of North America. It's the Uto Aztecan language family. Here's Uto Aztecan. And these are all the branches of tribes and people who speak a dialect of now. So here you have the northern, I, it's hard to get, I'm sorry, this is uh, this is uh, Shoshone Comanche, the southern Paiute, and the southern California natives. This is, I believe, it's Tarawimara, Hopi. Here's the southern California, which where my family's from, the Cahuilla, Luiseño, and the Waneño. Here in southern Arizona, you have the Pima, Ogota, Opata, Opata Sonora in, in, in northern Mexico, just under Arizona, the, the, the Pehuan, the, the Yaqui, the Mayo, Michol, Cora, and then the Bibil, this is Nahuatl also, and the Tiwas, Kiowa, Comanche. So all across the lands of this continent, this is the distribution of, of our language family. Here in, in this part of the Four Corners, California, in Texas, Going all the way down this part of Mexico, all the way there, you see little patches here in, this, in Central America, South America. So you see how wide ranging this language was. It was a language of trade, barter. It was a language of commerce. Mm -hmm. So if, if you wanted to make money in that, at that time, you needed to know how to speak this language in order to, to make a living. Uh, the Aztecs were the most powerful tribe of native people living in Mexico before the Spanish arrived. So at that time, 1500s, and the Aztec language is called Nahuatl. Many words in Spanish and English actually come from Nahuatl words. This is a good example of how the Aztecs have affected our life today. So for instance, chocolate, it would be chocolate in Spanish, uh, tomato, tomate, uh, tomato, tomate in Nahuatl, or for chocolate, 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 uh, avocado, avocate, and avocate. These are all Nahuatl words. When the Spanish arrived, they didn't change anything except for a few little syllables. And then English picked it up. So these are these words that we say today, chocolate, tomato, avocado, those are all next indigenous, ancient indigenous Mexican words in the Nahuatl language that we still use today. The word Aztec, I wanted to go over this really quick because we, we never called ourselves Aztecs. We, the word that Mexicans used for ourselves was Mexica. The X is pronounced with a sh sound. So when you see the X in Mexican, it's Mexican or Mexica. A Mexica yo is a person who is of Mexican descent. And the word Aztec was coined by a Prussian man named Alexander von Humboldt in 1810, and then was popularized by a U.S. historian and Hispanicist William Prescott in 1843. The reason why I say we Hispanicist is because there's been a tendency over the years to use the words uh, Hispanic or Latino or Indian or even Aztec. 
none of those words truly apply to our people because what it does is it waters down our history and disempowers us. For instance, it's like mom, mom, gave, mom and dad gave you a name and then someone comes along and says, oh, I don't like that name, right? Your name's gonna be this. And you say, well, wait a minute, my mom and dad gave me this name and that's who I am and where I come from. No, your name's this now. And that's what happened to all of us when we became baptized by the Spanish. They would take hundreds at a time and say, you no longer have your Indian names, you're all, according to what saint day you, this is, Jose, or Juan, different names, Spanish names. That's how we ended up with Spanish names. My last name is Lopez. I still have that name. It's a, it's a leftover from that, blaming the cultures. Some would say, well, you're two people. Why don't you honor that then, your Spanish side? Well, my, my teachers in college and my father and everybody else taught me, well, can you go back to Spain and have a vacation? Do you have aunts and uncles over there? Do you, do you, can you live over there and feel at home? No, we can't. I can't go anywhere I want on this continent and feel at home because I was, came up from this earth. And I have relatives in Mexico. I have relatives in the Southwest. So all my roots are here. So why would I identify with something that's way over there? I choose to identify. I know that that's part of us. But that is a history of conquest and violence. It's like if a, a person was, was raped and hurt, then they tell that woman or that man, you have to identify with that person now because that's part of you. We don't do that to, our, to the victims, right? So, so what we do is we say what, what we truly are. What are you? Where does your family come from? The president of Mecha Jessica said her family comes from Chihuahua. Well, the, the, the indigenous people that live there are the Tahuamaras. <coughs> and, 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 uh, and so she could say, well, look back where my grandma comes from, my great grandma, my great great grandma, my grandpa, well, they come from that area. That's who I am. I'm a Tahuamara. Right? You can say that. My grandma's from Sonora, Hermosillo. So she was Yaki. She was a Yaki woman. So that's part of who I am. My mother is from a, an indigenous tribe in California called the Kawiya. My grandma's from there too. So I'm Kawiya. And we speak the dialects of Dharma. So the people, there's hundreds of tribes in Mexico. Why do they say I'm Mexican? Well, because that's the nationality. They live in Mexico, the name Mexico. But ask them and they say, I'm Yaki, I'm Tarahumara, I'm Opata. All the tribes, they identify with, they say, that's who I am, that's where my people come from, but I live in Mexico, so I'm in Mexico. One of the reasons why the word Mexican lasted so long is because when the Spanish invaded and destroyed Mexico City, uh, that name stayed. That was the largest, most powerful tribe at that time that controlled the whole Valley of Mexico and even far south into Central Mexico, Central America. And so that name at that time was the name that stayed. The word Aztec also comes from, I think, it's part of this whole breakdown here. There's Aztlan, Chicano de Aztlan, okay? So Aztlan is the land of snow egrets. There is a place called Aztlan in our language and in our oral history. Aztat means stork or heron or egret. Aztlan anywhere on a Nahuatl word means place of. So Aztlan, place of snowy egrets. Azteca is a person from the land of white egrets. And it could also, there's other words in our language that ascat means ant. Astli, wing or instrument of harmony. Deca, a person, man or woman. So if you put astli and deca, azteca, a person who becomes an instrument of harmony. I just kind of did that on my own because I like the way that breakdown was. And it fits in with our presentation here. If we count in Nahuatl, we can count from 1 to 13 here. And this is Se, Ome, Yei, Nawi, Makwili, Chikwase, Chikome, Chikwei, Chikonawi, Matlakli, Matlakli Iwan Se, we go back up to one again, Matlakli Iwan Ome, two, Matlakli Iwan Yei, 13. And you can go all in the thousands. Well, we, we focus, in my family, we focus on these 13 and masterpieces. The number 13 is important. I'm gonna, we're going to break down how it shows up in, in here. In these uh, pictures, in these symbols. But I want to show you something that I learned along the way. And I kept asking, why is the number 13 so important? It's a sacred number, and we based our calendars around that number because 
of the math that's involved with it. So if you take the numbers one through 13, all right, that's in that direction, and then you reverse it. The only numbers that line up are seven. And you're gonna find out seven shows up in here also. We're talking about cosmic numbers now, uh, sacred geometry. We're gonna get a little bit into the math here, not too deep into it, that'll be part two, because we could be here for days. Um, if, we, if we were to add all these numbers, they all add up to 14, all the way across. If we were to subtract, this starts at, that's the, the, the number of harmony and balance, the central number seven, and then we subtract them, and it goes two, four, six, eight, all the, even, all the way out, four, six, eight, all the way out. Now I played around with these numbers, and I kept adding, multiplying, subtracting, dividing, and this balance is what I got on paper while playing around with these numbers. So when I said, if, if, if these numbers are like that, and this is an expression of the math of the universe, then let me apply this to the geometry. And so I started, in our culture, we always use the circle and the square to begin anything because of the earth, the circle, and then you know, the square is the math that a uh, builder uses when he wants to measure precisely at the right angles. There's a tool called a square. And uh, in masonry, Freemasons use the, the math of the circle and the square also to get divine numbers. And then I started applying that to, well, then maybe that's what they use for the pyramids. Maybe that's what we use to understand how to build a pyramid. And then I started understanding, well, we, there's 10,000 pyramid sites all across this continent. 10,000. In Africa, it's only in Egypt. In Asia, they have maybe one place where there's some pyramids. But in Mexico, and then all across the indigenous lands from Canada to South America, there's temples, there's pyramids. There's worshiping centers. So we are people that were in love with math. We are in love with sacred geometry. We are in love with uh, beauty and harmony and balance in our lives. And we clocked our lives according to that. And that art, I guess you could say. It's, it's a form of art. How could something so beautiful be developed in this way where we lived our daily lives according to this and had our ceremonial times there according to this math and not be a, a people who produced beauty? Before the Mexicans arrived in the valley, the Mexicans as a tribe, there were groups of Mexicans called the Chichimeca, and we'll get to that in a minute. But before our people arrived in the valley of Mexico, there had already been a, you know, thousands of years of history and culture <coughs> in the valley. Um, has anybody in this room ever been to this place? Yes. It's, we got a guy in the back, and Sochi we have here. This is in Mexico, just northeast of Mexico City. And uh, this is the Pyramid of the Sun. Oh, sorry. This is the Pyramid of the Sun that you see in the distance. This picture is taken from the Pyramid of the Moon. And then this is called the Avenue of the Dead, they call it. Uh, at this long strip, and just past the sun over there, there's another temple pyramid mound dedicated to Quetzalcoatl, who is the symbol of uh, knowledge and beauty. So this was a pre-Mexica culture called the Teotihuacanos. The Mexica called it that because when they arrived, this was a this place was uninhabited, so-called uninhabited at the time the Mexica arrived. So we're talking 100 BC to 550 AD. This culture flourished, and the Teotihuacan, the Mexicans called it that because it means holy, sacred city of God. Uh, and it's, it was the sixth largest urban center in the world at the time. The 250,000 people. So this was about a thousand years before the Mexica arrived. Thank you guys. So the world's largest pyramid is also in Mexico. It's hidden under a mountain in Mexico, they say hidden, but it's known as there's the word there, La Chihuahua de Pet. De Pet means mountain, place of the, the mountain of the red people. So that Aztec pyramid is four times the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza. <laughs> Uh, it was built BC, 
And then over time, over 1,200 years, seven layers of pyramids. There's that number seven again. It was the largest monument ever constructed anywhere in the world. <laughs> there's, the, there's the numbers for it. And uh, the Protecas were not the occupiers or the builders of this. They were, there was a, a culture previous to that known as the Olmecas. And some people call it the Olmex, our mother culture. Um, these are just different tribes of people from, from Mexico uh, that lived there at the time. And the Tontecas came after the Olmecas, lived here, built more pyramids. Uh, they layered the pyramids. They built one on top of the other. And to this day, um, well, let me just make note here. In 1519, there was what was called the Battle of Cholula. The Spanish showed up. They killed 6,000 people in one day when they went to this pyramid site, this holy sacred place here, a uh, place of worship for many pilgrims all over indigenous, uh, the indigenous Americas, so-called Americas. So in one day during their conquest, um, they say that the Mexica were trying to spin, spring a trap and kill them. Um, so they attacked and killed 6,000 women, men, women, and children in one day. Uh, and uh, then they built a church later on on top of this pyramid. So if you go to this place today, this is what it looks like. It's massive. Here you see the city built all around it. These are shops probably for tourism. Um, this was, this pyramid still exists. You can see how some of it comes off of the sides all the way around. And then in the surrounding areas, there's, there's temple mounds around here. So this was a place of worship for indigenous people. Uh, a center of worship from all across the continent. There would be gatherings where tribes would come from different areas of the land and meet and discuss everything. Like they discuss back in Rome or any other European culture we learned about in our society that they say was the greatest. We had it on this side of the world too at that time, pre-European invasion. Well, here we get to the Mexica pilgrimage. In the, in the oral history of the people who ended up <clears throat> Putting this together, gathering the knowledge over thousands of years and then culminating into this, the Mexicans were on a pilgrimage. Some say it began in Utah. To this day in Utah, they find on the walls and they find uh, relics and things of Mexican origin in Utah, in the caves and in the land of Utah. They say that that's where the pilgrimage began. And over 300 years, tribes of Mexicans moved south knowing that for a thousand years or more there was high culture somewhere in the south so there was a pilgrimage being made by what was called the collectively the chichimecas i call i say that this chichi word chichimeca comes from the word chichifti which means red and mecayot means lineage those two words together mean that the people of the red lineage uh, it has to do with i guess a lineage of, of tribal people out of all the tribes in these lands has to do with that particular lineage and, and groups of, of people who ended up building the greatest civilization in the Valley of Mexico after uh, other civilizations flourish, flourished. And, and this is important because this was the dominating tribe in the area where the Spanish were left. So there's a lot of uh, information about the interaction and the war and the fight that went down between the Europeans and Mexicans in the Valley of Mexico. But our history is recorded as being a 300 year pilgrimage from the Air Four Corners area all the way south into the Valley of Mexico. And when we arrived, we gave it the name Tenochtitlan after one of our greatest leaders uh, named Tenoch. And uh, it means land where cactus grows out of the rock. It was founded in 1325 and destroyed by the Spanish invaders in 1519, 1521. So two, in two years, they destroyed this sacred area here, this whole city that was made up of about 350,000 people. So it was the largest city in the world at the time, larger than any European city. And this is how it would have looked to the Spanish on top of the mountain, looking out into the valley. It was built in the water, in a valley of water. And there was causeways that our people built in order to walk and get to the center here where the pyramids were. These, and all along here, these little things right here called chinampas. This is where we grew food. We would bring mud up from the water, the base of the lake, and then stack it, and then uh, stake it in 
all the way to the bottom of the lake. So it was a floating garden that never needed to be watered. And then it was nourished with uh, a lot of different things, but human excrement. We had a system of uh, 300,000 people, 350,000 people were living at the time. There was a, a highly efficient system of using waste to feed, uh, to break it down and build soil and to feed the food that needed, to have the food that needed to feed this, this population. This is another picture of what it would have looked like with the causeways and, and the land and the river. Here, all along here, people lived all along this side, all outside this way too, but this was called Tenochtitlan. Another word for it is Anawa. It means the heart of everything that is. After the other sacred centers had already flourished, this became the gathering place again for the tribes from the south and the tribes from the north to gather and decide and talk about how things were going to be on our lands. This is the pyramid center, what it would have looked like. Um, the most important pyramid was this one here. Um, it, on top, it had two temples, one to Tlaloc, which was, some people call them gods, but these are the, I, I like to think of them as energies, forces of nature. And we're gonna learn more about that as we go along, that our whole religion or spirituality was based on earth, air, fire, water those most important things that make up life, death, and the continuity of everything that is. So the temples here was Tlalo, and then the other one was Huitzilopochtli. Huitzilopochtli was the name for a being that we believe came into this world representing the sun and was so powerful, his light was so powerful that he puts out darkness everywhere he goes. And that's the life giver. Because of the sun, we're here. So there was a temple to that. And it goes deeper, much deeper than that, but I, I can't go that far into it right now. But just know that these two sacred temples were to the two of the most important things. Water, thunder, lightning, water, electricity, and then the sun, or what people, European interpreters said, war. Uh, that was, you know, self-defense, uh, building up a society, becoming powerful and strong, <coughs> Um, as a group of people. In front here, you see the temple to Quetzalcoatl, which represented the wind or knowledge or beauty, sacred knowledge. Um, you see it's in the circle, shape of a circle, pyramid structure of a cone, like a teepee. And that, in and of itself, energetically, is very powerful, right in front. Just to the side here would have been the Temple of the Sun. This is where they found the Tonalama, or the Aztec sunstone. This is where they found it buried. And uh, we'll get to that right now in a minute. This was uh, the Temple of the Eagles also, because the eagles associated, connected to the sun, and flight, and the sky, and consciousness. There's all the, you know, dwellings. We had canoes, our food, our housing, all on the lake. The Spanish said when they first arrived, when they, they were on the mountain, they looked on it and they said they couldn't believe their eyes. They couldn't believe it. They thought they were dreaming. They saw something so beautiful. Here's another picture of what it would have looked like. This was all destroyed by the Spanish in the, in the span of two years. Um, to this day, you can visit this in Mexico City and uh, if, I thought that picture would have been there. It's not there. I'll find it right now. But anyway, you can visit Mexico City today and you will see the remains of what was left over from the Spanish destruction. You'll see churches built on top of pyramids. So they took down the pyramid, left the base rock, and then built the church on top of the pyramid. And to me, that's kind of like, you know, when you let a dog loose in a new area and it goes around and starts peeing everywhere? That's what the Spanish did. They were so afraid of this beautifulness that they had to put a dominating stamp on it and then ban anything that had to do with it, and then forcibly uh, converted us, and then outlawed our religion and our way of life. And then they, start, they started by breaking this all down and turning it into rubble, and then building their churches on top of our sacred temples. So this day, you can still see that when you go to Mexico City. Okay, so we're gonna start getting now into, uh, after that introduction uh, of our Mexican history and culture, and the foundation of the people that brought this into, the, into being. We're going to start getting now into the, the dynamics of this mechanism of 
universe's calendar timekeeping method. This is a picture of a pre, something that was before this. This is from the Mixtecos in Oaxaca. Um, the Mixtecos didn't always live in Oaxaca. They lived further up there, a, a lot older culture than the, than the Mexicans in the Valley of Mexico. So they produced this calendar or this timekeeping method uh, for their lives and for their society. And you can see the similarity here, a little similarity. You have the four directions here and you have this center beam you have a center beam here here are the four directions or the four ages okay and then you have along the outer, outer side of this you have uh the number 20 which 20 here 20 day signs one one circle of 20 days equals one month and so you have you have the similarity in symbols here through these dots and lines. Everything means something here. And we're going to start getting into it further. You'll, you'll see all these symbols have to do with timekeeping and the forces of nature. So the Mixtecos or the Mixtecs were responsible for producing this, which the Mexica would have come into the valley and seen and said, picked up on this knowledge and started building further on it. Other names used for the sunstone, this here. Uh, Tona Bowali, sacred calendar. The word Tona means to be sunny, to shine, or be hot. Tonali means day, heat, warmth of the sun. Or Tona Lama, the recording of the passing of the days, which we see here. Uh, Tona Tiu Aboshli, the book of the sun. Tona, the word Tona Tiu means sun. Aboshli means book. Uh, if you say Ili Pla, Boala Aboshli, it's a long word, but it means the book that guides and clears the way for the coming of the days. And the word week, day, or festival day, la boa, open to uncover, a mostly book. Some people call it the Guar Shikali. And the word Guautli, eagle, Shikali house, home of the home of the eagle, of the eagle house. Again, the eagle being associated with flight, consciousness. Um, so important facts about the Tona La Mai. Um, Sorry before the Spanish invasion and occupation of Tenochtitlan. Anahuac, there's that word Anahuac, in 1519, the Spanish priest ordered it to be buried and hidden. It was buried face down in a cathedral yard in the heart of Mexico City and what has had also been the location of the Mexica Aztec capital. It was rediscovered in December 17, 1790 by workers doing repairs on the Mexico City Cathedral. Uh, it was then mounted on the exterior wall of the cathedral where it remained until 1885. And today it's housed and protected in the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. It's a single stone carving and it's, it's 358 centimeters and uh, in diameter it's uh, 98 centimeters thick and weighs about 24 tons. And uh, it's a masterful combination of thousands of years of sacred indigenous knowledge systems of measurement and one of our last since the Spanish invasion. It was placed and then we found for the unity of the eagle and condor. And that's what I was telling you about when the condor is South America, associated with the tribes of South America, condor, or the condor. They would gather in the center, which was Anahuac at that time, then we found to discuss large matters of importance with regard to our civilizations. So our ancestors were created to help us learn to live in harmony, balance, and respect with everything that surrounds us. There's the actual picture of it. And these two little boys, it kind of gives you the scale of how big it is. You can see on the face here, they tried, it's almost like they tried to destroy it, but it was so big they couldn't, so they just buried it. They had, and thank God that they, they buried it because we would never know this. We would never know. I mean, we, would, we could go back to some of the other timekeeping methods and, and, and uh, things that were produced by other cultures, but this, again, is the masterful culmination of all of that timekeeping knowledge. In this one symbol taken from a distance in the, in the museum. Again, has anybody been to this museum? The brother in the back and so I'm, I'm encouraging you guys, if you ever go to Mexico, visit these places. It's amazing. This museum houses so much more that has to do with our culture, but that's a, another scale. Oh, there's the picture I was looking for. So this is Mexico City today. There's the cathedral. I mean, this is the center Socalo, what they call the Socalo, the center of gallery place of government. All the government buildings are here, and there's some churches around this area. But this is the remains 
of what would have been those huge temples and those huge pyramids. And this that, this sits on top of that. So there's an actual picture. Okay, so now we're going to start kind of getting into breaking this down. We have about a half hour left, I believe. For those who are just joining us, I guess, on Zoom, we went over the foundation of the history of Mexican indigenous history and knowledge to produce what it took to produce something like this. And now we're going to start getting into breaking this down. The reason why I put this picture here is because I want you to see these concentric circles. It's one right after the other. Now, this is kind of like what you see on the walls when you see a clock or when you wear a watch on your hand. It's the same thing. These concentric circles define the from, from birth all the way to death, from beginning to end, from, from humankind all the way to the cosmos. All right, and as we get into it, we'll start, we'll start breaking it down. This calendar consists of a 360-day calendar cycle called a Shiu Powali. Shiu is heat or fire, and Powali means the count of the days, and a 260-day ritual cycle. So the 365-day would be like for civil matters, governing, uh, governing trade and barter, and marketplace days and work days, the work week. It's the same thing as what we have, what we live according to today, but just different. Um, we also had a 260-day ritual cycle which governs spiritual matters, one's destiny, <clears throat> one's birth, one's, uh, one's path in life, okay? These two cycles together formed a 52-year century, sometimes called the calendar round. And you're, I'm going to break that down to you right here in a minute. The Tonal Pobali day count, okay, this one here, the 260 day, consists of a cycle of 260 days, each day signified by a combination of a number from 1 to 13, there's the number 13 again, and one of the 20 day signs. Here's the day signs. Okay? With each new day, both the number and day sign would be incremented. So as you go along, it's, it's like a, a clock that kind of ticks together, and there's a number and a force of nature that is combined and applied to that for that day that determines the, I guess, the, the energy of that day and how to live. So as it, it moved on forward and it clicked as a, as a like, a, like gears, the cycle that day signs would continue until this day would show up, seven flower, after which it would restart and then eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, then we go back to one again and go back to the 13. So it take 200, 260 full days or 13, 20 for the two cycles of 20 day signs and 13 numbers to realign and repeat. So that's what it would look like. Okay, so what's 20 times 13? That's 260 plus five, 265 days. Okay, and I say plus five because the way we measure, you know how we have a leap year every four years here to balance out the calendar? We had that and we did it in five days. Those were looked upon as five sacred days where we would shut off all the fires, stay in our homes, and pray, and think about the new day, the new time coming. They were called Nemon Temi. That's what the word was for, Nemon Temi. So the Tonal Po Wali, 20 times 13, 260 days plus 5, 265 days. And then the Shu Po Wali, 20 times 18, all right? 360 days plus 5 is 365 days. And they would work in unison as they went along. And they would govern the, the daily aspect of our lives. There's a picture of what you might see it, it appearing as. Mayan numbers are used a, a dot and a bar. Mexica, we use just dots. So you hear, see here one through 13 dots. And then it's associated with a symbol, which means read. And then it clicks over to the next one, right? It would be two jaguar, three eagle, so on and so forth. Let's see. Okay, as we get to this, I'll, I'll, we'll get to those day signs in a minute, but the most important parts of this calendar here is the sun in the center, but also this is also the earth. So it's one and the same. We use a lot of metaphorical things in our language and our culture to, to develop meaning, to get to the truth and the heart of matters. We use metaphors, but we would also combine symbols or combine forces to express what life meant. So this is the earth and the sun together, all right? And then uh, the Tonal Powaki, the, the days, these are the 20 days here. 
the symbols for the twin beams on the outer outside of the centerpiece here. The months, okay? The months, uh, you have the days that make up the month. So 20 of these days make up one month. And the months we'll get into in a minute. The Shui, the solar year, these serpents on the outside symbolize Venus, the planet Venus, because Venus is locked into a, it's like, it's in a tidal lock with Earth. It's just like the moon, all right? And Venus comes up in the morning and announces the sun's arrival. If you go out before the sun comes up, you'll always see that real bright star in the east come up, and that's Venus. And that's a, it's, it's associated with fire because it's so bright and it's, it's it locked with the earth and the sun that it, it shines and it, it, it has a lot to do with human, what happens with human beings on earth, the energy of Venus. So it's expressed here in the morning and then expressed here at night because in the night and the evening, you won't see Venus anymore, and then all of a sudden the sun will start going down, and you'll see Venus appear again, announcing the sun's departure. So we have night and day here. And you'll see the different colors here in the faces. This is a browner face than that one, which is the night Venus here. And the night and the day Venus here. They're called the Shi or, or Shi Guats, the fire serpents. And as you can see, there's fire on the backs of these serpents here. Made up of the body here, you have Sochi, which is a flower. It's a name. There's Sochi's name. It's a symbol for a flower, and three and ten dots. So, in, in there's a reason for the number ten and the flower. It uh, coincides with the seventh month of the Aztec calendar. There's that number seven again, balance and harmony. Okay. So there's in each body part here. There's a flower and ten dots, all the way down. Okay, and Around on this serpent here, we'll get into it further. I don't, I don't want to jump ahead. I don't want to confuse you guys. So we have a 52-year cycle, which is called a great cycle. All right? Shu Mopi. The reason why we have a great cycle here when there's 52 years completed, 52 years equals a great cycle. And then if you add the other 52 years of the, of the fire serpent, it equals 104. 52 and 52 is 104. It's a, a great cycle. Ancient cycle of time. It's called the Way of the Um The Donal Bowali or the sacred calendar, that's the whole thing. Nabiolin, four movement or the four ages. That are, that's these symbols here that surround the Sun Earth symbol. And we'll get to the to the meaning of these here in a moment. Makwili Donatiu, fifth sun. That's so we have one, two, three, four. We have the fifth sun here. Our people believe that we live through ages or spans of time that we live through um, and that each one had its own sun and that the earth suffered destruction under that sun and people had to move and migrate as a result of that destruction of that life-changing event and it's defined in these four ages here these four symbols and then the center is the fifth some say we're living that in that now. A prophecy says that that will be destroyed by earthquakes. That the sun that we're living now. Some say that fifth age has already ended. We're in the sixth and seventh ages already. Uh, Shukoa is a fire serpent, and then Nikilitsli, the new fire ceremony. So whenever there was a 52-year cycle that ended, we would have a special ceremony to co to commemorate that passing of time. Now this is Donatiu and Tlaltecuhtli. Grandfather, son, we're looking here in the middle, or Cuauhtlewanit, ascending eagle, and Cuauhtemo, descending eagle. So coming up, going down. Vlatecunti, earth, Lord, lady, the one who gives and devours life. If you can see here, there's, it almost, it looks like, if you think of her as a woman, here's her legs, and she's giving birth. These two hands are claws, evil claws, and she's giving birth to all of this with the help of the son. So you have the mother and the father, male, female, uniting to create life here. And in, in the face of the son, there's a number of things that we have to look at that are really important that express the meaning. Here in the mouth is a knife, a flint knife, that is very, very sharp. If any of you guys know about flint, we use them for arrows, we use them for knives. There's 
uh, obsidian or flint is sharper than a scalpel if you can get it to that that edge. And here again, you have the claws that you see here, and that just means that in speech, what I say and the, the blade itself, what I say cuts through lies, cuts through dishonesty, cuts through darkness. It's associated with fire because it's made up of volcanic material. So when, when, when the earth or the sun speaks or a human being speaks, we shall speak with truth and honesty and cut through lies. And so on the necklace here, we have jade, the nose, we have a jade plug, and we have a jade pendant in the shape of a heart. Here, jade is because that was a sacred stone that we used that represented the color of all things, or the center of the heart of all things. It was ranged from dark green all the way up to what the Chinese jade is like. It's like a lime green. And it was, jade is so hard that we used that to build pyramids with. We would cut stone with jade, jade tools. There's a book back here on the table that an engineer uh, did a study on how we made pyramids and he found classes of artisans who would pass jade tools on chisels to younger and younger generations there's a whole school of individuals that were trained in that way in order to build with jade chisels and jade materials so here we have the jade plugs in the ears jade nose plug jade pendant on the, on the forehead representing the color of all it is with the center of the heart of, of life and then we have these flares solar flares here when we get back to it being the sun, again, it's expressing heat or fire. Coming out of the ears and the plugs are feather symbols here that is associated with consciousness again, or flight, okay? These are called tonayos. These are symbols for wind. These little circles here on the ears, there's four of them, see? There's the four directions, or the four, uh, the four uh, numbers of harmony. And then, so as we get into the days here, um, and we go around the 20 days, the names for each one of the days here, it's crocodile in English, but it's Sipakri, wind, Ejeka. And we go this way because that's the way the planets spin around the sun. It's not this way, the way we keep time today. So you could, you could kind of say, if you think about that, you kind of say we're living in, in, in out of balance and harmony in our current lives, maybe that's what's why there's so much destruction, so much violence, so much war. We're, we're living in a backward way in this society that's so mechanical and uh, and so full of bad things. You know, people say that's human nature, but I like to think of human nature as something that can produce this and something that can guide us in that way and say, no, there's something different. So indigenous people live according to harmonic time. They live their lives in balance and harmony and then use things like this to express it. We have house, kali, lizard, ketzbali, serpent, koa, death, nikitsli, deer, masa, rabbit, toshli, water, at, there's at, from now at, now at, dog, isquinkli. You could, in Spanish, a lot of moms call their kids isquinkli, like they're being hitting on their nerves, you know, pestering them. And they never sit down, they're always like a puppy all over the place, they call me Squeaky. That's a name for a dog, it's like a little puppy name. So that's a name that's a Nahuatl word that's still carried over in our language. Monkey, also Matli, you guys probably heard of that LA band, also Matli, they name themselves after this, this energy. Grass, Mali Mali, Reed, Akat, Jaguar for number 14, Ocelot, Eagle, Kualtli, Vulture, Cosca, Kualtli, Movement, Onin, and this is the symbol right here of Onin, movement. If you look at that little symbol, it's the same one here. These four things here. Flint knife, Tekpat, there's the flint coming out of the mouth. Rain, Kiawit, flower, Sochi. And then it, it ends there. That's the 20 days, and one round equals one month. So if you had 18 of those, that's 365 days, okay? Now, when we get to the sacred calendar, uh, well, let me just start here. So I went through the 20 days, and here's, if you look at these, all of these here, associations, this is the forces of nature that were associated with these days. So I won't read through every one of them, but you can see, look, Lord of Sustenance, Lord of the Dawn, 
Lord of smoking earth, music, song, and dance, you know, flowing water, the moon, rain and lightning, Marge, fire in time. So yeah, it's all nature based because we lived that and it provided for us. And that's who we were, who we are. So with these day symbols here, you have an association in nature that define that period of time on earth. And we have celebrations for every one of these things in the months. We would celebrate every one of them in beautiful ways with song and dance and drums and food and everything. And uh, we are a, a very seriously nature worshiping people. We still are. Here's the symbol of Lamin, okay, the centerpiece again, with that sharp blade, that ray of light coming out of the middle here, piercing darkness. And we already went over these. Just to let you know, these two hands or claws inside there, some people say they hold human hearts, but there is red there. And I like to think of it as, as being blood or it's holding the, the beating, the thing that keeps us alive. My son asked me a little while ago, what keeps us alive? What keeps us going? Well, it's not just the pump. But if we were to use an analogy like a vehicle, what keeps the engine running? He was asking, I was telling him about a car that was screaming and had a sound that was screaming, it was a fan belt. And he said, well, what's the fan belt connected to? And I said, well, it's connected, it, it turns the engine. Inside the engine, there's oil that turns pistons. And then it's also connected to an alternator, which is electricity, there's your charge. Okay, and it's also connected to a water pump, which cools the engine, there's your water. So you have earth, air, fire, and water. What makes an engine? You get the materials from the earth. There's oil, that's old dinosaur bones and old matter. They pull out of the earth. And then you have pistons. And you have the water cooling that heat and electricity, keeping it in harmony to keep that car running when you push the gas. Right? So there's an analogy you can think of. It's all contained in this here. All right? And so there's your fire, earth, air, which is the feathers water which is it could be this also and not just the sun rays it could be water too um, and then you have blood which is the liquid of life there's two kinds of blood in the human body there's lymph and then there's blood lymph is another river in the body that keeps the blood healthy if your if your water is polluted if your river of life is polluted you'll get cancers of the blood you'll get sick very fast your cancer, cancer uh, your, you'll get cancer and your blood cells won't heal as fast so you have to keep the lymph and the blood clean the way to do that is to stay in balance and harmony with everything as much as possible. I like to say that it looks like a hummingbird. Okay, and the hummingbird is, is a beautiful animal, very powerful, small but powerful, very fast, and it can fly in any direction at any time. And its wings don't beat like a regular bird, they beat in, a, in an S, like this. Okay, so that's what it looks like. There's the, kind of looks like that. There's the beak, the wings, the feet. The reason why I put hummingbirds is because Huitzilopochtli means hummingbird on the left, which is associated with the left chamber of the heart. And I mean, we go into the deeper layers of what it means, but I can't get into it now. But just know that Huitzilopochtli, the temple on top of that main pyramid in the, in the center of Mexico, there was a temple who worshipped this energy, this life force here that we're talking about, being electricity or the war that natural forces have with each other in order to keep our life going. That's a symbol for fire and water. Atalachi noli is the word that we use for it. And there's the fire, there's the water linked together, okay, as warmth. We go back to this, you can see that. There's the DNA symbol. Yeah. I mean, if we performed surgery back then, they found evidence that we performed surgery with obsidian knives. You had to know that we would take a cadaver and open it all up and study it. We were that smart. Nowadays, we don't know that. They don't teach us that they were that smart because they just want to say, oh, ah, they were just roaming around the desert eating uh, branches. Indians, you know, who wants to live like that? Nope. Native people are the ones that brought all this to this world through our science and cosmology. All right, so here's another picture with kind of like the black, the darkness in the back that stands out a little more. You can see here's the blades of light. There's daytime, nighttime, daytime, nighttime, daytime, nighttime. Okay, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and the, and the number fours again. Okay, and then there's the concentric circles. We already went through the middle part of this, but let me explain the four ages here really quickly. 
This here is the age of, of, of jaguars. They say, and there's the four tonales, right? Four ocelot. You have four dots in this one, four dots in this one, four dots in this one. Okay. In the time of these, there was a time when there was, they say there were giants walking the earth and they had red hair. And they were always trying to eat us. The jaguars were our friends. They would eat those giants. And during that time, we had to flee because they were after us and they wouldn't leave us alone. This is the oral history that was passed on. And you can read it in any of these books. During this age of time, hundreds of years, we migrated and we had to move because they were after us. Coincidentally, in the early 1900s in Nevada, they were doing some mining operations. They dug up a six and a half foot tall red-headed giant bones in a cave. Okay, that's a Paiute story. The Paiute speak a dialect of Nahuatl. So if you start connecting the archaeology to the anthropology, then you can, some of the, you know, this makes sense. Here, this is uh, the age when there was a lot of wind, hurricanes, and we had to move again. Okay, and this is the symbol Sipaki. It's a, a or no, a heka for wind. Same thing. There was a hurricane, we had to move again you know, over hundreds of years. Here is the symbol for Kiawi, the rain of fire. We were inundated by volcanic uh, disasters, lava flow, we had to move again. And here is Kiawi, the rain, the water, the earth flooded. There was a flood in like a biblical proportions, and we had to move again. And then we ended up here in the fifth sun. Through the, throughout this time, our tribes, our tribal people, the Chichimecas, migrated across the continent, ended up in the Valley of Mexico, and produced this thing here. Okay? So before we get to the fire surface, I want to explain just a little bit of math here. This here is the, the date that ca this calendar was produced. It coincides with the Julian calendar in the, the year 1470, <coughs> but it's the symbol of 13 Sochi, the 13 flower. So within the time of this calendar, it was produced, this was made in that year. This is the stamp that says this was made during this time. Now, if we move from the serpents, we already went from the inside, and we start from the outside and go in a little. These serpents here, there's little horns you see that are touching the, the fire symbol or the ray of light. That's plugging into this. And then we come around the body here, and then it plugs back in here. See that? So there, it's, an, it's an interaction, a birthing interaction. And this fire is touching in different parts here. These tonayos, the symbol for wind, are touching these symbols for, for feathers, or these finger feathers here. So you have wind and sky, and then you have fire here off the backs, and the four, I guess you could say like a spark plug, <laughs> generating electricity back and forth, giving birth through wind, Wind, uh, air, wind and air, and fire giving birth from the cosmos to the earth and sun, the planets here. And then uh, off these little fingers, if you count these little fingers in here, between the, the rays of light, well, if you count the feathers here, there's 10 in each circle here. And then there's three that come off here, so that's 13 in each sector here, 10 and 3, 13. There's the number 13 again. Here you have the, the symbol of the stars with five on each one. It's 10, 10 fingers and 10 toes, five fingers, five toes, okay? So the number 10 here to symbolize the human body, but we count it from a system of 20, which is 10 and 10, 10 hands, 10 feet. I mean, 10 toes, sorry. And uh, so then you have the number 13 off of that. And then right here, you count these little uh, symbols, these little, I guess, electrical pulses that are connected to the backs of the fire serpents here. And you have, if you count, there's one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. So it's you have four, eight, 12, 16, 20, and then plus, uh, plus the, the one, that's 21. And then uh, you do it on the other side, and it, and, uh, it all equals out evenly. So if, if it, this side is, is a photocopy of this side, same and same. And then on the, on the bodies of the serpent here, you have 13 of these flowers with 10 numbers. 
And at the end, you have four bars, which are considered sheaves gathering the years. So if you start with the head, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, all right? 13 times four, right? That's 52. And then 52 on this side. So you have 104 years, a great, great cycle all together in balance and harmony. And then this tail here that's touching the year date and then giving birth to the earth and sun and everything that comes out of it, it flows out of it. This would be the 14th, which is the rattle or the tail. And there's that number 14 that we get on the number line here that equals and balances everything out. So this are, those are just, that's just some of the math. Um, the sheep watts are linked here at the mouth to show the unity between night and day and the, the cosmic forces that unite in order to create something like this. The Shukwat serpent on the top of the head has seven um, symbols for the seven stars of the Pleiades. And the, you can see the Pleiades in the night sky here. It's just a little bunch of stars. But we believe that that was in connection from, it supposedly has its own sun, that constellation of stars. So if it has its own sun, it has its own light. And if we get further and further into the meaning of that, then one could come to the conclusion that maybe from that star system, we gathered this knowledge, or individuals from that star system shared that knowledge with us. There's the shoe watts just highlighted for you. So this is a symbol of, of Quetzalcoatl. Um, it was the serpent, again, the snake was associated with earth, earthly beings, but it also has feathers, which the night, day, or sky and earth united as one to create knowledge and beauty on earth. Here's a picture of a man in, cave, in the body of a serpent. There's the tekbat, the blade again, that represents honest speech or cutting through darkness and then surrounded with feathers. Okay, and he has hearts here. There's the rattle. Some say, I've read before that some say that some very, very old rattlesnakes have been found where their, their scales almost look like feathers. Like the, the, the rattlesnake kind of grows feathers. And the rattlesnake is indigenous to, to our lands here. It doesn't grow, it doesn't show up. A rattlesnake is, is in Asia, Africa, Europe. It's a snake that's indigenous to this area. So if you look at the snake's body, it has its sacred geometry on the body of that snake. And it has math. So just from observation alone, you can understand sacred geometry just from one animal. Some say that on the bottom of a rattlesnake's tail, a certain rattlesnakes you turn it over and you can see a, a, this symbol, a happy face underneath the rattle. If you look on the rattlesnake's <coughs> the face of the rattlesnake, it has a V, like these rays here, uh, a Venus symbol for Venus. Um, so that, that's just a, another picture there for you guys. There's a close-up of the link, linkage to the night and day, night and day there, and how that is just blown up so you can see it better. And this this is the conclusion uh, of, of the presentation. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, I wanted to let you know also that uh, I do have these available that uh, I made for my sons. They're little coloring books. And then it breaks, it breaks the calendar down real simple for kids each day and the meaning from big letters so they can learn and study it and the names. This one tells you all about this, the cosmos. It goes through everything I just went through, just presentation in a very simple form. So if you leave your name and, uh, and you request one, name and email, I can give you copies of this. Um, this is just something I brought so you can see. We did write, we were writers, but we wrote a pictograph for it. And this is uh, an example of what was called a codex, or codicet. Now, the Spanish, at certain times during the invasion, they took these books and burned all of them. They put them in piles and set them on fire. So who knows what we lost? But there were a lot that were preserved. And then there were some that were written later, uh, right after the Spanish invasion by scholars of our society that wrote the history of our people because the Spanish asked them to. Now, whether or not there's a lot, if they were writing just to please them or writing, you know, but this is, this is how we wrote. 
and we wrote on uh, different kinds of bark paper. So uh, mostly, and the book fig paper was a lot, the fig bark we would use a lot, and we would, we would put it through a process, we would take it off the tree, we would make an accordion out of it, like that, and we'd fold it back up. And we had all of them stored in safe places. When the Spanish arrived, they burned all of our books, a lot of our books. And uh, so this is an example, it's called the Codex. Um, almost all of them are in museums in Europe as we speak. One professor in Mexico a while back was in uh, the museum in Britain and he just folded one up and put it inside his jacket and walked out of it and took it back to Mexico. That's the only one that's in Mexico right now. And I believe it's in the Museum of Anthropology. So you can see an actual one uh, footage. I mean, you can go see it yourself for what it looks like. Anyhow, um, that's the presentation, folks, and thank you for your time and patience, even though we ran over. What's your birthday? Uh, December 3rd, 1986. Okay, so here's the here's the years, okay? Each year, you can come up and look after it. You guys switch the lights on really quick. Right, so the year goes all the way here to 1922. I'm to go back here. And then you go all the way up and you said, what year? 96. 1996, you find 1996, and you're associated with the number 10, that five, which is the blade. All right, so that's the year the year you were born, 10 Pekpat covers your year. Now your day, what, what month were you born? Uh, 12. So December. So you find December, you find December on here, okay, and our teacher Masatsi, he, he broke all this down and easy to understand format. So we have November here, and it goes this way. Okay, okay. so let's see, let me find December really quick. There's November, March, let's see. November. Go over here. Okay, what was the date? Third. Okay, 12, 3. You're born on a Monday. All right, and then the, the three or the, the star, it means that, uh, that, that, that that's the, the third day of the Aztec day. So the, the third day and the, on a Monday in our calendar, December 3rd. So if if, if you look up here, here's the day. You were Masak, the deer, governed your day. And then you look across to the celebration of the month. What we celebrated at that time was Pan All right. So he, he created this little book for us to look at and just so if you go to Masat here and then the deer, the deer symbolizes our agility, instinct, intuition, perception, and sensibility as well as all the fun. The deer is activated by the energy of the sun and is a messenger of love and peace from the grandfathers. And then Banquets uh, if you look up that what we celebrated during that month. Okay, so your the, your cosmic companion is level. And it's what the earth drinks, the water from on high, and all of its manifestations. This is the principal action to fertilize and produce sustenance. And uh, it belongs to the context of the science of life. Uniting two life, generating actions, heat and water. And so that's, that's what the, your cosmic companion, uh, when you're brought into this earth, how you were, what you're stamped with, your breath of life. And the Masa, you're associated with the beer of Masa. So, anybody else? October 12, 1983. Okay, so 1983. 1993. 1993. <laughs> October 12th. 1993. 1993 is seven kami, that's seven house. All right? And then October 12th? Yes. October 12th, or one on Friday, and then the third day 
uh, of the aspect calendar. Walt leads the evil, you're associated with the evil, and if you go all the way across, it's a uh, Panitsky. That's the month uh, what we would celebrate uh, during your time. So um, if you go over here to Walt Lee, and he, this is so, remember that one slide that I showed you where you have the days and then what's associated with the months? That's that's what tells you. So if you go to quietly, uh, the eagle, our vision, a solar symbol. Um, this is the physical and spiritual renovation, purification, and cleansing of ourselves and our environment. Here's the presence of freedom and liberty and the guardian of the house of creating energy. And your cosmic companion is Shipe Tote, uh, a red smoky mirror and our guide that changes us, a leader, the conscious organizing of time and space that leads to our transmutation. Anybody associated with an eagle's got to be powerful, right? How do you email my? Okay, I'll do it to you for you. Any, qu any questions before we go? Are there any questions at all? Um, yes. I saw the, the symbol for um, water and fire. Yes. Now, the fire, the water was touching the actual fire symbol, but the fire never touched the actual water symbol. Is that just how it was painted, or was it, does that mean something? No. Like, if you see it, like the, the blue was touching the red, but right. here. The red only touches the yellow, it never touches the blue. If so you take a look at it, but I'm, I'm sure they touched on both sides where they overlap. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the touchy point. Okay. So where they overlap, yeah. that's fire water to create life, so electricity and, and blood, or okay. water, or liquid. You need those two things to create life. So, yeah, they, they some some symbols have them interweaving too. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, they, they touch for sure. Any other questions? Stop clapping. <laughs> 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 my son, don't my crazy son. They hear this all the time at home. That's why. <laughs> well, be sure to take a reading, a reading list and sign your name. That way you can, uh, I can let you know about future events. Any other questions? No. Before y'all go, I want you all to come. Yes. Just as I'm share our culture and share our family. Just know that doors are always open. We're happy to see you every single year. They said, and there is red right here, sign your name, let us know if you have any questions of any kind, if you want to see something new, we'd love to have your ideas because we're not just here for us. I'll pass your names and emails on to Miguel. These are the officers of META, and there's a few more here too. And thank you to our individuals who helped set the uh, technology site. Appreciate it. <laughs> He wants to see a similar real quick. Thank you.